There we go. So now we're going to start to cover the residential income property purchase agreement. It's car form RIPA, RIPA. All right, so once again, we're only going to go over the portions of this contract that differ from our regular residential purchase contract, okay? So we're going to start on page one, section D, close of escrow. The, this is not different, but there are different considerations in mind for close of escrow. So when you have an income property, you typically need a longer escrow in order to perform all of the duties. I guess that's there to, yeah. Hi, Harrison. Hello, sorry. Can I, I ask you a huge favor? Depends. Can you move over and make friends with these <sighs> ladies? It's that bad, is it? It is. I don't okay. like being on, right. the, on camera. Everybody knows that. Is that required part of the well, job to record it? No. It was something I did to enable my students to be able to learn if they have another job. Okay. So besides Roxanne, Sharon, Tamara, and I'm sorry, Eve, Eve, Eve. Sorry. and Eve are, are all ladies you probably want to get to know. Um, Sharon is probably teacher's pet twenty. Aww. She's at every class, so she's always a good reference. Okay. <laughs> That's true. That's true. It's true. I gave her a, an award because of it. <laughs> uh -huh. All right, so we're going to start over now that Harrison's joined us and right, just go over section D of the residential income purchase uh, agreement. That's the section for close of escrow. And so typically it's gonna take longer to close a residential income property escrow. Why? Because you need additional information. Why else? You need to provide usually 24 hours notice to get access to the interior of the units. Now, there is a form, and I forget the acronym, but it's like notice of intent to sell, something like that, that the landlord can deliver to the tenant and there's time frames on it, so I want you to read those documents if you ever intend to use this document, but I highly recommend delivering it to the tenants in order to set yourself up for, six, uh, for success. It allows you to verbally, somehow, that means phone, communicate a request for entry or notice of entry to the tenant. Legally uh, allows you to do so. Still has to be 24 hours, but what does that save you from doing? It saves you from literally printing out the notices, driving down to the property, and posting them on the doors. So, what page um, is this? it's not in here. Okay. It's a separate card form, and I don't remember the exact name. It's like notice of intent for sale or something like that. If you're in car forms in the little search bar at the top, you can probably type in the word intent and you'll probably find it. I think it's one of the only car forms that has intent in the title of it. But I highly recommend using that. Yeah. Um, that's a little extra cherry on top. Um, just set you guys up for success. Um, you're going to need to gather information. You're going to your buyer inspections are going to be longer. So I like to call a listing agent if I'm making an offer on a tenant occupied property because you never know the skill level of the listing agent. I like to explain why to them I'm asking for a longer escrow period. Also, if they intend to deliver the property empty they may have to deliver a 60 day notice, right? Asking that they deliver the property empty if they can do it because it's not subject to rent control or because the tenants are willing to move. They usually have to provide a 60 day notice to the tenants. Also, if they do that, they provide that notice. Um, I generally want there to be about a week at least of lag time between my close of escrow and the time that the tenants left. Why? They may change their mind and fight it. They may accidentally leave late because they're just not prepared, they may be upset and trash the place. They may just be messy, irresponsible people who accidentally damage it, uh, moving furniture out. Who knows? In any case, I want my buyer to receive the property in good condition. So if contractually there's enough time for the tenant to be out and for the existing owner to actually make repair and clean up, then my buyer can get a clean repaired place. All right, so um, now that we've covered that, I'm gonna have a skip over to page number three of residential income purchase agreement. We're going to go to section eight, item A and B. And yeah, all of A and B. 
So basically we've already covered this in the listing contract, but from the buyer's agent's end, right? You don't know what these items are, included or excluded. Items that are gonna be included, uh, page three, yeah. So items included and excluded, right? Normally for your buyer, you're writing the things that your buyer wants in there. Well, the tenant may own some of those things. So you're gonna call the listing agent and you're going to find out if you can, who owns what, so you know if your request for items that are there is actually valid. You can't ask for a tenant's possessions because it's not the sellers to legally sell to you or negotiate with you on. Make sense? Okay. Um, 8B4 eight is about leased or leaned items, and we've talked about this many times. The most common items are alarm systems, laundry room, washer dryers, and solar panels. The owner of the income property may or may not own these items, so you're going to need to know because the buyer may need to assume the terms that the seller has, or the seller may need to negotiate payoffs somehow, or these items may need to be removed from the property prior to the um, purchase taking place. Okay, so we're gonna skip over to page four. Nine, security deposits. We've already talked about this a little bit when we were discussing the listing contract because we were talking about how a landlord needs to hold security deposits. Um, but just so you know, the way security deposits are transferred from the seller to the buyer is actually through escrow, through the seller's proceeds. So through the seller's proceeds. If the seller is holding these interest-bearing accounts for the security deposits correctly, that means that the seller is actually going to have to transfer separate funds from these accounts to escrow. Do they do that? No. Escrow just takes them out of the seller's proceeds. Mm -hmm. But what the seller will have is the exact dollar amount, including that interest that's been bearing on those accounts, if they did it correctly. Problem is they're not usually doing them correctly. And most people aren't aware of what the standard um, minimum requirements for interest are. Like I said, it's like pennies a year. Just, it, you're probably, not 100%, but you're probably safe to say that Anyone who has tenants in place should pay them $5 per year they've been there. You're going to be more than covered, okay? Um, unless something drastically changes or they're living in units that are $80,000 a month and their security, security deposit was $160,000. You know, so these are outside of the box situations that could actually occur. So please, you can't take me at my word on this. This is just for purpose of example. Yes? Um, so in college, uh, I was living off campus. We had to put down a security deposit, and then after they take basically whatever they want. What state were you in? Uh, Oregon. This is uh, so I'm talking about specifically city of LA, and then I'm talking also about California. But each state imposes their own rental rules, so I couldn't. So you can't comment. take part of the security deposit in California for restoring the property to its original state. Of course you can. So then, how would? How would they be like, wait a minute, this is missing $2.17 in my interest, but you took I don't know if, I don't know if interest is required in Oregon. I don't know. Um, how would they know? Well, because here, at least in California and with LA, you have to provide an itemized receipt for all of the work that was done in relation to any repairs that you made, which would allow you to make those deductions. And you'd better be very, very careful about it because there is very, uh, strict rules and stipulation about it and the tenant can take you to small claims over it. Um, I got taken for a ride on my very first apartment as a 18 year old kid. They took my entire security deposit and I'm a clean freak to the max. There was no damage in that place and I didn't know there was anything I could do. So I would, that wouldn't be the case now. <laughs> um, in any case though, uh, you know, there, there's even further stipulation than that. So Los Angeles can put more restrictive law, like adding that per, um, the interest bearing, and that's only for rent control, by the way. Only units that are subject to rent control. Um, yeah. But the state has its own laws also. So let's say someone lives in your single family that's not subject to rent control for 10 years, and the walls, it has to be repainted because it's trashed, and the carpet. Can you deduct for both of those? 
No. no. It's been 10 years. It's been 10 years. Everything has a life expectancy, and even if they've been in there five years, you may only be able to charge for 50% replacement. And then you have to try to find similar materials to what was there, because if you're going up against a tenant like me in court over a dispute on something like that, I would be like, well, you put in $3,000 wool Berber rug, and I'm, I was living on you know, the cheapest brown carpet that you could possibly throw into a rental. So just keep in mind that the burden of proof is upon the landlord, not the tenant, right? when it comes to disputes about security deposits. Okay, um, but I wanted you to know that escrow transfers security deposits from seller to buyer slash new owner landlord. Makes it easy. Mm -hmm. And where do they get this information from? The tenant estoppel certificates that everyone signs off on. Buyer, seller, and tenant. 10, closing and possession. We've already talked about why it might take a little longer to uh, process an escrow for income property, but I want you to specifically look at oh no, this is not it. I'm sorry. There's another section here. I guess we'll get to it later. Um, so I just highlighted that section in my my notes again because um, oh no, wait, it's here. Okay, ten closing and possession section B. Seller occupied or vacant property. Remember, I told you the owner may very well may uh, be able to deliver uh, income property vacant. And the way that our contract is written is that um, you know delivery of possession is to be made at 6 p.m. on the date of closing. So if you find out for some reason that tenant's running late and the escrow period that you have doesn't account for it, will you need to modify the terms of your contract? You definitely will. So modification of terms is for the listing agreement. Amendment of existing terms, AEA is the document we use to change any term that is referenced in any way in our mutually excluded accepted contract. Once it's an accepted offer, you use the AEA to change any term that's in here. Not the MOT? No, AEA. MOT is for a listing contract only, modification of terms. AEA, and it used to be an amendment. We just used an amendment for this. But about two years ago when they made a bunch of changes, or they introduced a whole bunch of new documents, AEA, amendment of existing terms. And it makes sense, but not that many people are familiar with AEA yet. But it does, that is technically what should be used, not an amendment anymore. If it is a whole new term or thought or addition that you're making to the contract, that's different. You can do that in an addendum. Terms. All right. F, condo plan development disclosures. So if you are selling income property that ha is, an, and not just income property, but tenant occupied property, let's say it's tenant occupied, um, and it's in a condo complex, they're going to be HOA rules and regulations. So you also want to make sure that tenants have a copy of HOA rules and regulations, or that if you're representing the buyer, the new owner does, right? There may be stipulations in the building as to how long the term of the rental can be. There may be stipulations as to you know pets, things like that. That is not up to the property owner, it's up to the building. And so your buyer needs to be aware of these items as well because it's going to affect their ability to rent to certain people under certain terms, right? Okay. Um, let's see here. On page five, section 12, residential one to four properties. This whole section goes through what's required. I'm only going to talk about TDS. TDS is not something that is required on a multi family income property. What is required in its place, guys? The ESD, exempt seller disclosure. Why? Because the seller is not living there, right? But they may actually know stuff about the condition of the property, prior problems, repairs, upgrades they've made. This is also an ESD is used by the seller in a seller disclosure package on your typical uh, residential sale when they haven't been living in the property. So rule of thumb is if the seller has not been living in the property, you know, it could even be like an executor or a trust in another state. Um, they would fill out the ESD instead of the TDS. All right? 
They are still required to make any known disclosure. It's just that they're not held to the same standard as, as someone who lives in that property. What if the seller does live? Doesn't matter, right, as a property. Um, if a seller lives at the property, I would think that you would still use an ESD if it's multifamily because they don't live in all of the units. Okay. But if they can fill out the TDS, by all means, you're not violating any rule to go above and beyond if they can fill out the TDS. Um, and then just FYI, guys, when you do AVIDs on multifamily, you do one each for each unit. You don't get to use one AVID for the entire building. You will see at the top of the AVID, it'll say, you know, check here if this AVID is in, you know, a building with more than one, you know, dwelling unit. And then it will ask you for the unit number. Oops. <laughs> Shh, we're recording. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right, so we're gonna move on to 13, seller documentation and additional disclosure within the time frame specified in paragraph 19. Seller shall disclose, make available, or deliver as applicable to the buyer the following information. And I'm just going to list these items out. We've already talked about them, but it is actually part of our contract, and it's always a good reference point. As a listing agent, if you need to remember what it was that you needed to get from your seller in order to properly advertise the listing, and then also, as the buyer's agent, to know to enforce and ask for these things, A, rental service agreements. What if there is no existing lease agreement that anyone knows of? Get that tenant estoppel or maybe get just a letter between the owner and the tenant mutually signed verifying the terms of their tenancy. I would use an estoppel certificate. B, income and expense statements. That means records of who's paying what rent if they've been paying all of their rent, any late fees. That means um, you know the landscaping fees, the pool maintenance fees, any costs. C, tenant estoppel certificates, those are required if it's checked, only if it's checked. Is there ever an instance in which you wouldn't have that checked or shouldn't have that checked? Hell no, not from the seller's side or from the buyer's side. If you don't get tenant estoppel certificates, you have a whole lot of liability on you. You're basing information, you're passing on between the buyer and the seller. Um, and if that becomes problematic at any point, and you didn't do your due diligence and try to get tenant estoppel, you're gonna be in some trouble. Now, how about tenants? Are they always happy about having their building sold? No. no. So there may be instances where it's impossible to get a tenant estoppel certificate. This would be problematic if you don't have an actual existing mutually signed lease agreement between the property owner and the tenant, but you can memorialize it you know, um, and it's the buyer's calculated risk at that point. But the financial records sort of back up what that tenant's been paying, right? Mm -hmm. So you do have a little bit of check and balance in place. All right, just a word to the wise, especially with rent control tenants. You want them to really like you. They can cause a lot of problems for you. Opening complaints with the cities. They are very, very legally protected. Um, be nice, be kind, be considerate. Give a heads up, bring presents, encourage the seller to perhaps, um, you know, give them some sort of incentive to make the property easy to show. Now, I don't necessarily recommend this avenue because if you give them a, some, but, but some landlords will give the tenant a break on their rent. In the city of LA, if you do something like that and it's documented that way, they technically have like maybe a legal basis to say, well, now I have reduced rent. I don't know if you can structure it as something called a loss of an amenity or a loss of use. I don't know. But some landlords choose to financially incentivize their tenants through reduction of rent. I would highly recommend instead that landlord chooses to financially incentivize them in a separate check yeah. if they're going to do that. Yes. So then that kind of ties into what I asked earlier, okay. which is then do you get a credit? Like you're saying that then the tenant could be like, wait a minute. It's been lowered now, you have to wait every year to raise it by 2% again? Yeah, so don't do that. Write them a separate check from a cer uh, from a separate account, from, from the owner's separate personal account, not through their operating account for that building, okay? Because this is a seller, or maybe it could be operating account, I don't know. Just a separate check and like very clearly like make an agreement, you know, um, that this is 
you know, compensation as a courtesy, something like that for the interruption um, and for, you know, helping with, with cooperation during the time during the sale. Um, and make very specifically clear, this is in no way a rental credit or reduction to rent. Seriously, you can probably get away with Starbucks gift cards. Yeah. Like I said, That's make friends. Right. Um, one of the most important things to find out uh, from your seller is how their relationship is with the tenants already, because it may be beneficial to have them more involved. It may not be. So you're going to have to use judgment. Um, I have a question. Yes. If the seller has been sued by the tenant a couple times, uh -huh. you have to disclose it. Yeah. So if I'm representing a buyer, escrow closed, and we just find out. And the seller didn't disclose it? No, it didn't. It there didn't are see. sections. I think we even read in the listing contract, and there are sections in the purchase contract mm -hmm. where it says that the seller needs to. And if you reviewed your seller disclosure package and you don't see anything in there, it also asks, or, you know, it also asks specific questions about past or pending litigations affecting the property. It's very general and broad. You actually have legal recourse. So I would have your client speak to an attorney. Okay. A real estate attorney. Yes. I always have to be careful there. They'll go ask their cousin who is like, you know, entertainment law attorney and they'll come up with this craziness that I've never heard. Anyways, um, okay, uh, section 13D, survey plans and engineering documents shall, or so it shall at no cost deliver to buyer copies of the same, but only if they have them. They're only required to if they have them. E, permits. So if they've done any work, they should provide permits. Does this typically happen? No, not so typically. Sort of like the seller is technically required to be the one who provides the natural hazard disclosure statement disclosure to the buyer, but the seller doesn't know this info. There are services where you can get copies of all existing permits. It's like a hundred bucks. I have a good resource for you if you need help with that. I would highly recommend having the seller hire that person to um, pull the permits and deliver it to the buyer, or the buyer to hire that person themselves and get copies of them. And unpermitted, um Square footage doesn't count towards the value of the home, correct? Well, not in an appraiser's assessment, but would that change the opinion of how usable and desirable it is in the mind of the buyer? Not necessarily. Would that change the opinion of how much something someone would rent a property for? No, not necessarily. So the only time you have to be careful about advertising square footage that's not permitted, and you have to be careful with the appraiser. Um, assessing the value. So if it's a significant amount, it might cause a problem. And any unpermitted structure some a lender might have a problem with. Um, so you need to disclose to the buyer. I don't know if I would bring that up at the time of the appraisal. Why would I unless they ask me? I don't think I have that obligation unless they ask me. So if you purchased a house that had unpermitted work, mm -hmm. would it at any point be possible to then get it permitted? Like after it's what is it? I mean, it depends on what it is. But let's talk about this after class, okay. and I'll go over that specific example with you. Um, short answer, no. Long answer, yes. Okay. But it's creative. Yeah. I can imagine. <laughs> um, all right. Uh, F, structural modifications. That's going to be similar. And all of these, of course, are going to be in your seller disclosure package. Um, oh, what I did want to say was this reference the time specified in paragraph 19, which is two pages on, you don't need to turn to it, but that's a seller disclosure period, right? And in this contract, it is seven days, just like it is in our, res um, our residential purchase contract. If you haven't already got this information together or the listing agent hasn't already got this information together, it's probably going to take the seller longer than seven days to get that info together. So if you're the listing agent and you don't have it, I or the buyer's agent, I would recommend extending the seller disclosure time frame out a little bit, a few days at least, you know, nine, 10 days instead of the seven. Okay. Um, so we're going to um, skip to page six, section 15, changes during escrow. So I'm gonna read this to you because this is a powerful paragraph. What page? Uh, page six, section 15, item A. Changes during escrow. Prior to the close of escrow, seller may engage in the following acts. Prep 
proposed changes subject to buyer's rights in paragraph 15b, rent or lease any vacant unit or other part of the premises, alter, modify, or extend any existing rental or lease agreement, enter into, alter, modify, or extend any service contract, or change the status, status of the condition of the property. What does that mean? It means that if you are in escrow, you can't make any new leases, you can't cancel any leases, you can't extend any leases, no changes. So the buyer all of a sudden, uh, there, is, there is one exception in the section below B. You can propose the changes to the buyer, like you may have a really good high rent paying tenant in one of the units and their lease term is up during the course of the escrow and they wanna extend. The, the buyer may very well say, yes, 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 extend them. Um, but under section B, the seller has to give a notice of proposed changes at least seven days in advance to the buyer. And the buyer can say no, or they can cancel the contract. So that gives the buyer a lot of power here, right? You cannot do anything to your property, basically. Your, a property, even um, not income property, should stay in the same condition it was in at the time a buyer made an offer, and it should be delivered that way. This includes like, okay, I had a, I was doing an Avid one time and I had a homeowner following me around and I'd like write smudge on ceiling at living, east wall in living room. And he was literally following me around with a paint can. I was like, you cannot touch anything. You're not allowed to change it. I know you're making it better, but it's a, you're not allowed to do it. Technically, the buyer has to have the property in the same condition as the time they made the offer. So I'll have a seller sometimes call me, um, especially residential income. Got a plumbing problem, we're making a repair, blah, blah, blah. Now I have to make an upgrade or repair down below. Well, I have to speed up this time frame all of a sudden on uh, proposed changes or repairs, things like that. Basically, I just write an email or an amendment and I just say, you know, work is necessary at this time, yada, yada, yada. Buyer has been informed and, um, uh, you know, agrees to, to allow the seller to perform these repairs or make these changes, right? So I just want you to have this in, in your mind. Same thing on your regular residential property. Um, let's see, I had an active leak during stormy season that um, was discovered not during inspections, but after inspections during the course of escrow. Of course, we had to make a new disclosure to the buyer and that gave them five additional days, right? But we also had to tell the buyer, well, we have to get this stopped. You still have contingencies left, not your physical, but you still have contingencies left. Um, so um, we don't know that you're gonna close escrow. And I'm sure if you intend to or don't intend to, you, you wanna allow us to repair this fix so there's not further damage. But we did actually have to get the okay from them to have a leak, you know, like to have some roofing repaired. I guess not the okay, it can nullify the contract. Basically we had to inform them and we have to obtain their their okay in order to, to, to keep the terms of the contract, is a better way of saying it. Okay, um, we're gonna skip to page seven, section 19, time periods, removal of contingencies and cancellation rights. Remember I was telling you, you probably wanna extend your seller disclosure period, 19A, you see seven is written in there. I prefer somewhere around nine to 10 days. That's the seller disclosure period? Uh-huh. Just because if the listing agent doesn't have the info together or there's a problematic tenant, let's say the seller's traveling or they have an accountant or a management firm that they get all this info, they just need time to coordinate, get it all together, time to review. They may give it to you and it may be missing info anyways. So extend by 7 to 9 or extend to? Extend to seven, uh, 9 to 10. 9 to 10. Mm -hmm. if, it's a, if it's a more complex one, I might do more. If they're like, we have everything and they're, they're super organized, maybe I even shorten it depending on my contingency periods. Who knows? Okay. That's it. That's the only differences in the rest of the purchase contract. The rest is all your standard stuff. All right. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. You're welcome.